Yeah, so I'm delighted to be joined by Alan Kenny, who is the Head of Science and Education at Dlanbia Performance Nutrition. Um, and the reason I wanted to get Alan on um, this afternoon to talk to our followers across our various social media channels here in the LGFA is that we recently partnered up with Nutrimino Nutrigo, who are the new official snack partner of the LGFA. Obviously, we wanted to make uh, a big deal of it at the time, but COVID-19 and all of that stuff has, has more or less... Um, put some of our plans on the back burner but we do have Alan on to talk about the uh, the range that is available and the benefits of um, uh, nutrition particularly because he has uh, many qualifications in the world of nutrition and Alan is a native of Newbridge in County Kildare just before we came on air Alan we were chatting off air um, if you want to just bring uh, good to have you on board first and foremost Alan yeah thanks very much for having me uh, just to bring uh, our, our viewers up to speed on uh, your background, Alan, uh, and how you got into this whole field and this, uh, what is now very much a discipline, I'd, uh, I'd imagine. Yeah, certainly. Um, so my undergraduate degree would have been in exercise and health studies in, in Waterford IT uh, a number of years ago. And then um, that would have been a broad degree. So I wanted to specialize and I always had a, a, a big interest in nutrition. I would have played football myself um, and, and soccer as well. So that was kind of my passion. And I did a master's in, in exercise nutrition science in the University of Chester in the UK. Um, so then started working as a performance nutritionist and I've been fortunate enough to, to kind of be working steadily um, since I finished my master's and, and I've been exposed to a number of different sports, different age athletes. I've worked in Ireland with a number of GAA teams and I've got to work abroad in the States and, and done some work um, in performance facilities there with athletes from like Major League Baseball and the NFL and stuff like that. So it's good to see a, a good contrast between athletes, but ultimately nutrition is nutrition and people are people. That, 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 that's what it boils down to really. And so I'm just looking um, at some of your posts on LinkedIn uh, recently. The Optimum Nutrition for Health and Performance Education course went down very well with our members. Uh, and we also ran a competition last week on Instagram and Facebook to win Nutrimino hampers. And I have to say the, the engagement and the level of entries was absolutely uh, phenomenal, which is a good start to the relationship. Um, in terms of the range itself, Alan, talk to us about some of the key the key products that our members uh, and the wider and uh, and you know their wider communities can can look forward to uh, to enjoying. Yeah, so I guess the the main range and um, being the, the official snack provider is going to be like the NutriGo range. And um, so we have milkshakes which are um, uh, ready to drink, um, available in, in like vanilla, um, strawberry, and chocolate. Yep. And those are uh, 25 grams of protein per, per drink. So it's a 330 ml drink with 25 grams of protein. Um, so that's a really nice way to just kind of get a, an additional um, hit of protein during the day as a snack. Or it's also a good pre or post exercise um, choice as well. And the other thing that's proven really popular with um, your members and I guess our team as well is the, the, the snack, the wafer bars. So they're going to be a lower protein intake, but they're a lighter snack. Um, Again, just so someone will hit their protein needs throughout the day. And if we look at ladies' Gaelic football as a sport, you know, it's, it's an impact sport, it's intermittent, there's going to be um, a, a rigorous training schedule. So obviously the demands on those um, players are, are fairly high and they're, they're training a lot. And, and one thing that we really see is protein is, is obviously associated with muscle mass and that's a, a clear thing that most people know about. But it really does a lot more than just build muscle and it's going to help maintain um, muscle mass, repair muscle from all of that training um, and just some really other benefits from a day-to-day -day basis. So ensuring that people hit a protein uh, number each day is one of the go-tos in terms of performance nutrition. That's usually one of the starting points for me when I'm working with any team or athletes. So having a, a product that can help get you there is, is going to be really, really beneficial. And before I kick into um some general questions which would be of specific uh, relevance to our, our players uh, and and our members. I'm going to ask you a little bit of a selfish, selfish question, right? So for the month of April, I signed up to a challenge which was to run 5K a day um, for the Do It For Dan uh, charity fundraiser, which thankfully reached reached this goal and I managed to get the, the, the 30 uh, 5Ks done in the month. I've run a few marathons before, so I'm, I, I'm used to a little bit of distance running. But I would do a lot of my running in the evening time, right? So because So the kids are down 
um, it's a little bit cooler in the evenings. I like to run in cool weather, not the not hot weather. Uh, but I'd come in maybe off a run. Now, last night I went for four miles, right? And I came in and I had a bowl of Special K at about half ten at night. Now, can you tell me something better that I can be eating at half ten at night after a run before I go to bed that's not going to sit uh, where I don't want it to sit? Yeah, it's a funny... Well, it's, it's a really good question, and particularly in the... In the Gaelic football world, obviously, most people train in the evening time as well. Yeah. That's all challenge because um, people are getting home late like that. And, and then, you know, it's whether to eat afterwards. I mean, the whole idea of training is to, is to damage your, your body and stress your system. So, you know, when you're training for, or you're doing your run, you're, you're not getting fitter, faster or stronger during that activity. It's afterwards when you, when you recuperate and recover. So that's when nutrition comes in. So the post-training window is always something that, that's really good to take advantage of. And um, it's less important than what you do overall over the course of a 24 hour period. But definitely we'd want you to, to, to do something for recovery post-training, even if it's late. So usually I would want people not to eat that late if, if it's close to a bedtime, but after a run or you've done some training, something would be good to, to consume then. And special K and breakfast cereals aren't, aren't necessarily the best foods in general, but <laughs> You've, you've just been running and exercising. So something then with a, with a bit of uh, sugar, which is going to replenish your glycogen, is actually quite good for recovery. Now, the only thing I would add to that maybe is add in a little bit more protein. So, you know, having a, having a bar or a snack or a, a ready to drink um, with that or, you know, protein powder or adding some nuts or some Greek okay. yogurt in a bit of a mix. Um, so honestly, it's, you're on the right track there. It's not too bad. Um, and this, like with food, it's not necessarily that there's bad foods, there's just bad timing. So if you had been sitting on the couch watching Netflix for the evening and then you got peckish and you said, right, I'll have something and then it was a bowl of special K, maybe not the best decision, but the fact that you've already ran and exercised, it's, it's, it's actually quite a decent one there. But you're just not, you're not getting any protein. So if you add a protein in there, you're, you're improving that already. Um, it's kind of personal preference too. Some guys will come home and eat a big meal after training, and then there's other guys I know, um, girls that won't won't necessarily feel they're they're able to. So something, yeah, like a drinkable meal is always good in those scenarios, um, where it's light and bypasses your your kind of main digestive kind of issues. So. Okay, interesting. Um, we're not going to dwell on what's actually happening out in the wider world at the moment now, but in more general terms, um, we're in unprecedented strange times. So we're in a situation where our players obviously aren't getting out onto uh, onto the field of play, but they are managing to keep themselves ticking over in whatever uh, way that they can with home training sessions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I presume during a time like this that they're... Um, their normal eating habits or nutritional intake is now going to shift to, to somewhere else or something different. So what does the new look like or what should it look like for, for, for elite, uh, elite players Alan, and indeed uh, you know, your, your everyday club player as well? Yeah, um, yeah, so that's a really interesting topic that, that um, we're kind of figuring out as we go a little bit. Um, and really, yeah, the, the challenge is obviously... Um, people have a, a certain amount of energy expenditure usually. So if, if, if it's your average player who maybe trains three nights a week and plays a game at the weekend, they, they expend a certain amount of energy. And now with no games, that's kind of um, dropped. So the challenge there is, and we see it often with people who get injured or retire, is they end up gaining weight. So people gain body fat. Um, and that's because we're kind of a little bit more habitual with our food intake. Because so then training drops, but food stays where it was. And then you've got this excess or surplus, and that's where people can run into trouble. The other consideration for a, a period of, I guess, reduced activity is people may lose muscle mass because they're not necessarily using as much muscle as they were. And so there's two real things I would look at. And one, I suppose, as well, the other thing that's important to, to say from a nutrition point of view is it's kind of okay to not be 100% on point right now. Like, because... There's even from a professional point of view, like like people are working from home. That intensity of work is often lift, uh, is increased. There's tons of different things. There's workouts. There's different things, and and it can be a little bit overwhelming. And some people just aren't in a place right now to really be on top of their nutrition. That's fine. But if you are in a position to uh, make some positive changes, and then there's actually some ways you can kind of take advantage of this situation. And one of the ways definitely is. Um, 
using the time to upskill and, and, and learn some new things around the kitchen. I know people, myself included, have really done a lot more baking than ever before. So um, that's something that people have been doing. But if, if someone has, has, like cooking is a foundational nutrition skill, particularly for younger players. So if, if this is a time where you can get better at that, that's going to serve you. Like that, that goes into your toolkit then for the rest of your career. Um, and I guess then the main thing really is if people are, if people's activity has reduced, generally their intake should, should reduce a little bit as well. And I would like to try and keep people with a similar, um, a similar kind of pattern throughout the day because I know a challenge is just being near a kitchen all the time and not necessarily having the, the social cues of it's break time, it's lunch time, it's tea break and whatever else. So I would mm. try and encourage people to, to stick to those kind of timelines and try have a, a structured approach so you're not just kind of um, mindlessly snacking throughout the day because it's obviously an easy, easy thing to do. Um, yeah, so planning ahead, having a kind of structure, knowing that if your activity is reduced, your, your intake should reduce. And then the other thing is, is protein intake, which is going to help um, conserve muscle mass. And that's really important because if people aren't training and eliciting that same um, you know, effect on, on their muscles, they are somewhat at risk of it's you don't use it you lose it kind of so keeping a high protein intake is going to be um, protective of those muscles to prevent muscle mass and, and leave people in a better position when when people can return to a fuller kind of training and the, the other benefits i guess as well are, are you know people might have a it's an opportunity to improve some aspects of body composition if if it's someone that needs to maybe um take off some fat or if it's someone that needs to, to build some muscle which can be hard to do in season now is a good time to kind of build that muscle and um, so yeah there's a few different ways of looking at it but they're the main they're the main points from a performance nutrition standpoint okay yeah just, just in in terms of snacking and because uh, there are some days where uh, you, might, you might have heard of halt hungry angry lonely or tired so you're just gonna uh you, you might reach for the chocolate a little bit more on those days um now, at the same time, the snack bars, I've tasted them. They're absolutely beautiful, the Neutramino bars, right? But it's not a case that you go and you eat six from the box. You, you know, you can eat one with a cup of tea or, or what have you. When would be the, I, I suppose, they're okay as snacks, aren't they? They're, they're not perceived as, as, uh, as chocolate bars. These are got real good nutritional value and that protein intake as well that you talked about earlier in the conversation. Yeah, like quality produce, I guess, is a big kind of policy of ours. And like as well, we have a food first kind of policy as well, which, which you know, and then we supplement with supplement a good diet already. So I'd encourage everyone to really focus on uh, overall diet initially. Um, and then you're able to supplement that with good products. Um, and yeah, ideally, um, what, what sets the, the products apart, I guess, in terms of, from your normal confectionery and that it's just trying to, to get an increased protein intake would be one of the main things. And for maximal protein synthesis, which is like the, the remodeling and building of, of muscle and um, tissue, you kind of want to have a, a, a steady supply of protein, protein throughout the day. So ideally through at least you know, three or four meals spread out throughout the day, getting a decent um, protein intake in each of those is what we always recommend for for lean mass and kind of um, support and lean mass, particularly for people in team sports. And um, I mean, with snacking as well, the other thing to consider, the biggest thing is creating a positive environment for food. And if your fridge and freezer are full of, um, you know, tasty snacks that aren't necessarily the best for you, or your freezer full of ice cream and it's calling you every evening, you're eventually going to succumb to it. So setting up your house um, as a kind of positive place to a positive nutrition environment is really beneficial because if it's not there you can't necessarily eat it and um, and that comes down to kind of psychology i guess and um, and you know being in the right state of mind and setting a plan when you're, even when you're doing your shopping and and that stuff as well so you kind of stay in one or, one or two meals ahead of yourself and um, like meal prepping is a great tool that people can use as well so that they have snacks laid out and mm. um, that will take an hour or two on a Sunday and, and you can, you know, set out your week so that you're, you're never really left. Cause it's at times when you're left with no, no choices. Maybe you're, you're pissed off with work or you're pissed off with family or something and you go to the kitchen, there's nothing there. That's when you'll go for the, the yeah. whatever frozen pizza or something like that. Whereas if you stay one or two meals ahead of yourself, you kind of um, prevent those situations occurring. 
So fill the fridge with the shakes and a nice fruit bowl and uh, Nutramino wafers over the microwave would be the way to go rather than the, those temptations that you're talking about, Alan. Um, ju just in general terms, obviously you've worked with a number of elite level athletes. Um, I'm sure some of them are, are better at diet than others. Uh, so this isn't necessarily a time for when they're told, look, we won't, ha we won't be training for a while. I'd say subconsciously some of them might be thinking, well, hey, it's, we can eat what we want time. That's not the case, Alan. Um, no, like uh, ideally not. Uh, I mean, obviously, it, nutrition is a is a more difficult one to police than um, not that you want to police it, but then say gym or something like that because the strength and conditioning coach might see their players more often, whereas um, you're you're relying on a, a a good relationship with your players as a nutritionist that they will trust in you and and what I use is um, you know WhatsApp and Facebook and stuff where people can can put up pictures and meals as well to stay on top and really I think. As this uh, as this goes on, the like there's examples in other sports um, where there's been periods of, of um, time where where the leagues and stuff have shut down for like contract lockouts and stuff in different sports. And after that, there's always an increased um, injury rate. So what happens is after this, players that haven't been training tend to pick up more injuries because they're rushed back into it. So this time is a critical time it's, it's an extended off season or extended pre-season depending on what way you want to look at it but I would think that the teams that look after themselves the best and, and train and manage their load and, and gradually return to play in a, in a good way with you know teams of people supporting them in terms of physiotherapy strength conditioning nutrition they're, they're the teams that will, will you know be able to there'll probably be a, a a significant difference between the teams that do it right and the teams that maybe don't during this time. So, if, like the example you provided there, if someone goes away and says, "Look, I'm not playing for six months here. I can kind of do what I want," they're just going to have to start a, a very tough preseason again when it starts again. Yeah. So, yeah. So it's 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 a difficult one. Like it, it's hard to keep going. I am 100% all the time, and, and that is difficult in terms of planning and stuff when there's no real dates set yet. But Ideally, with nutrition, you're trying to get players to a level where they look after themselves kind of 24-7 anyways, and then you're just kind of tweaking their diet coming to a match day just to get the maximum um, you know, the maximum benefit of what they're doing from a food point of view and preventing any, any negative effects of nutrition, which there can be too. So, but it's, like, it's based on a good diet 24-7, so hopefully you, you instill kind of good behaviors that players will, will follow right the way through. And this is a very difficult question to answer because there's, it, there's so much science involved in it and it's more, is it, is it a mixture of quantitative and qualitative, the answer that you're going to give, but how long could it typically take for the effects of uh, turning what's maybe a poor or average diet into a really good one in terms of the impact on, on physical fitness and performance? And second to that, if you drop off a little bit, how long will it take for, for, the, for you to notice that you're not performing as, uh, as you were previously when you were on a good diet? If that question makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess there's, there's research or so from, from a detraining point of view. Um, like we can lose uh, training effects significantly from three or four weeks. Um, and that's from a, a muscular point of view and also from an aerobic point of view. Um, so if someone is like totally detrained, they will uh, they will start to lose fitness, and um, it can happen as quick as two weeks um, for a rogue week. But generally, two, three, four weeks on, if someone is like not doing any training, they'll start to, to lose some um, some fitness. In and Alan, is that more of a dangerous time when you're in that detraining phase that you are more likely to perhaps eat stuff that you shouldn't normally uh, be eating, uh, or that you wouldn't normally eat, or or is yeah. there any is there any correlation there? Uh, not that I know of from a, like, if I was to say a specific, you know, like after three weeks, there's some food, like, sure. because it's, no, it's, it is difficult um, to, to, yeah, yeah. It's very hard to pinpoint any one meal or one thing in, in terms of nutrition. It's always like a broader kind of picture. And we sure. never, it's, we, we can, we can figure out the exact training effects from research on, of, um, like post training um, protein and, and different things like that in controlled studies, but it's very hard to have a, a, a bigger controlled kind of um, research based on on specific meals or if someone does these behaviors for this amount of time, this causes this injury because a lot of the injuries will come from from an exercise and muscular point of view more so than the nutrition. Um, 
in terms of how quickly someone, it depends on what level someone kind of, kind of lets themselves go to or where their starting point is. Um, some people will react quite quickly to a, to a positive nutrition plan and others will, will take a little bit longer. And um, there's always going to be a little bit of variety person to person. So yeah, it's very hard to pinpoint one thing or one exact like kind of window of time that's like, oh, this is the, the, the super kind of difficult area. Now, if someone hasn't been training and they come back and they have like a really high training load, research has shown then that people are more likely to pick up injury and also pick up illness. So but that might vary person to person on how they manage that load. And there's a lot of external factors too, like stress and sleep. And, and you know, you've got one person that maybe a student might have a lower um, workload day to day and, and come to training in, in a pretty good state compared to someone that might have to um, that's been working eight hours that day and then has to travel an hour and a half to train. So there's a lot of external factors. We, we, there is some really good research in terms of exercise and nutrition and we know the difficulties and dangers of detraining and, and not following a good nutrition plan but because there's so many external things it's hard to say exactly which is the cause and um, there's usually a multitude of kind of uh, factors involved but definitely once you're detraining fully like two three four weeks you're going to start to see a drop in fitness levels and then if someone is like rushing back they're going to see uh, an increased risk of illness and, and um, injury as well in those time periods okay it's interesting and uh, in terms of hydration as well how how does good hydration benefit good nutrition is there a is there a link or a relationship there if you're under hydrated is it going to have a, a negative impact on, on your nutrition and if you're well hydrated will that benefit what uh, the good stuff that you're putting into your body yeah a hundred percent and hydration is often overlooked and it's such a it's such a it's such an easy quick kind of thing to fix with people and um, and just being in a hydrated status is going to be a, a, a such an effective thing for, for ensuring that you're optimally um, performing. So dehydration by as little as 2% will start to have an impact on, on, on cognitive functions or decision making. So particularly if you look at um, at ladies Gaelic football, like into the second half or extra time and stuff, and decision making becomes more and more um, important, that can have an impact on that. And then further rates of dehydration will start to have an, an impact on performance. And that's been shown time and time again. So um, a good a good kind of range like most people will generally fall into like a two to three liters of water per day is a, is a good standard recommendation and um, we can check the color of our urine to see if we're hydrated or not so it's a simple one to monitor yourself and uh, it should be a very pale yellow to, to clear and um, ideally if it's if it's a like dark yellow or luminous or whatever you're uh, you're probably dehydrated and um, then you can drink more water as well and um, and yeah so like it's just such a quick easy cheap one to fix and um, what i do with teams or athletes as well is particularly because people have different sweat rates and um, if you weigh yourself pre and post training you'll be able to see how much weight and um, you dropped and that's going to be representative of um, a fluid loss so and you can see people if you drop a kilo and um, just from a training session you can drop a kilo easily and then you need to replenish that um, that water as long uh, as well as kind of re recover from your like repair your muscles and do all of that so essentially being hydrated nearly speeds everything up and being dehydrated essentially can slow everything down because water is used in, in the majority of functions in the body as well so it's 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 critical really and it's something that we've a lot of control over and can easily monitor so it's it's definitely something to, to keep an eye on especially as the weather's nice and people are running and sweating absolutely absolutely and if you had some key messages for for our players or lgfa players i mean do you have any simple tips uh to keep them going while they're while they're wondering when they'll get back onto the field of play yeah so i think what's important to remember is is you're an athlete and you, I, one thing I'll always stress to people is um, um, athletes is to, to keep that at the forefront of your mind that right I'm an athlete so I need to treat myself like an athlete people train like an athlete you need to eat like an athlete sleep like an athlete and you know like if someone is is like take an average college student for example that that, that plays uh, for an inter-county team and they're probably playing for a college team too but you know if they live at home say they might wake up and they might have breakfast like their family and eat the same foods they might have college and lunch with their friends and eat the same foods and then they might come home have a snack come home have dinner and eat with the family again and often i'll often ask people you know 
did your meals look different to other people's? And often it's the case they won't. So either that person's family are eating like an athlete or they're maybe not eating like an athlete. And like, there should be a difference in their approach in terms of nutrition from the day-to-day person and just have a better understanding of the demands of the sport and the demands that are being placed on your body. So if someone has a friend that maybe isn't an inter-county footballer, their diet shouldn't look the same as yours, really. Someone's doing something wrong if they're like kind of the exact same. And then that kind of brings in a bit of confidence too, like particularly from working in the States, the, 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 the guys that would come in and, you know, like their identity was built around being an, an athlete and, yeah, and they were sure. so confident and, and that kind of showed in everything that, that they did and they wouldn't have taught. You know, I, I've had cases where athletes would maybe feel shy about asking for more or, you know, I don't want to be seen having a protein shake during the day or, you know, whereas like if there's a little bit more kind of um, confidence and, and treating yourself like an athlete in everything you do, then that kind of, then you can kind of make better decisions that way. Um, and like I always say to our players too, that there's no, there's no special aisle um, that any other team can go to and pick up certain foods. Like everyone, it's, it's, it's building a good environment and everyone has access to, to the good foods. And, you know, like professional athletes can't go into Tesco's and get foods that uh, myself, yourself, or any of the ladies get, like footballers can get. So that's kind of where, yeah, the message I'd, I'd sent home is treat yourself like an athlete. And that should come across, in, hopefully, in most of the things you do, but particularly what you do from a nutrition standpoint. Well, here's, a, here's maybe a, a question a little bit from left field. You've obviously worked with, with, with the elite level athletes, um, many of them, and some of the key traits of, of elite level is, is that self-confidence you talk about, maybe um, a cockiness stroke arrogance, which is, which is no harm sometimes, um, an elite mindset, uh, everything is done to, to, to the nth uh, degree. And in terms then of nutrition, have you ever seen a player, and you don't have to break any confidence here, have you ever seen a player pick up another player on their eating habits when this player knows that he or she is doing everything to the letter of the law? Uh, you know, we hear about player-driven environments and that if somebody's not pulling their weight in terms of a training session on the field, they'll be pulled up on it. Have you ever seen anybody pu- pull someone else up on, on what they eat and how they eat? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and and it, it always in a positive manner. Um, particularly, um, look, in most team environments, there will be some, some uh, um, form of a leadership team within the players group. Sure. Um, and that's a, a really great like, way of kind of having uh, input from the players and, and kind of players having a bit of a say. And there's always going to be natural leaders in a team. And, you know, you've also got a big age difference in most inter-county teams. So you've got players in their 30s and you've got teenagers. And they can kind of bring other players along and, and kind of help them out. So I have seen cases where, where some players, particularly say if you have a, a Facebook group or a WhatsApp and, and there's requirements from players, it might be, look, the, the half-back line players are all putting up pictures of meals this week or put a post in a day and some don't. And then players can... can kind of call them out a little bit on it in a good or a nice way. Um, uh, look, I don't know if you're watching The Last Dance at the moment, the Michael Jordan documentary on Netflix. Bits and pieces, yeah. Yeah, like, he's, uh, like, you know, a lot of his teammates didn't necessarily like him at times because it's his, his, his drive to, to do everything and kind of bring people along. But it's good, like, as well, like, they had success. And often is the case in... Um, so you know, success leaves clues and, and people that are really driven and you know, they're trying to bring their teammates on. So when it's done in that way, it can be really positive. And, but I have seen it, yeah, where players in a leadership group will kind of set standards and that standard will be set across the board, how you approach training, how you approach nutrition. And yeah, it's all, it's all connected. And, and the, yeah, you, if, you set, if you let your standards slip in one, they'll, they'll slip in others too. Sure. sure. And it's been great talking to you. Um, just to finish off where we started, if people want to find out more about the, the new range from uh, the LGFA's new official snack partner, Nutramino, Nutrigo, where are the best places to go about doing that? Um, yeah, so the product's going to be stocked in, in, in a lot of your major suppliers, um, like your, your Holland and Barrett. Um, you can also buy it online, bodyfit.com and nutramino.com um, if people are buying online and, and in some stores as well. So you'll see them popping up um, more and more as well over the next while and hopefully we'll be able to to do some more partnerships and initiatives we're, we're excited about being involved and kind of um, looking forward to help out and hopefully be a, 
be a provider of, of good products that will help people achieve their goals and, and success going forward. And we wish you well. And thanks a million for your time today. It's been great chatting to you. And there's so many more questions I could ask. Uh, so we might catch up for uh, another chat real soon. Yeah, perfect. Thanks a million, Jack. Um, anytime, yeah. And best of luck if you're keeping up with the running. Cheers, Alan. Appreciate that.